This is COVID-19 Seattle. I'm Dave Ross. And I'm Aaron Granillo. We have some sobering new statistics about kids and the coronavirus. A new report from the American Academy of Pediatrics says at least 97,000 kids tested positive for COVID-19 in the last two weeks of July alone. The Academy compiled those numbers. And now, according to the data, at least 340,000 American children have tested positive since the beginning of the pandemic. That is about 9 percent of all U.S. cases to date. These numbers come just as many areas try to reopen schools. Tomorrow, the Seattle Public School Board will vote on whether to start the school year fully online, as Superintendent Denise Juno recommended. President Trump yesterday still downplayed the risk of children contracting COVID-19. They don't get very sick. They don't catch it easily. They don't get very sick. And according to the people that I've spoken to, they don't transport it or transfer it to other people. He also said there is, in his words, a tiny fraction of death when kids get the virus. The data, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, show COVID-19 hospitalizations and death are uncommon in children. It found no more than one half of one percent of cases involving children resulted in death. Okay, so how has this all changed, the debate over reopening schools then, Dave? Well, I think that uh, it's going to be up to parents. The statistics are clear. Children do not generally die of this, but some do. Some have gotten very sick. There's also the concern that just because you don't die doesn't mean the virus doesn't affect your overall health. And it only has to happen for a few children for parents to think, well, what if it's one of mine? And we also know, I mean, schools don't exist in a vacuum, right? I mean, kids go to school and they come back home and they can spread it there, too, and they can spread it to their teachers. So you have to think about community spread as well. Uh, I also want to mention just a few Important caveats, uh, according to this report, it says that the uptick in cases amid children is due partly to more testing, but that's just part of the story, of course. It also says different states define a child differently. So most do use the age range of 0 to 19, but some others like Tennessee and South Carolina's cutoff age is 20. Alabama, it's actually 24. And the report says the number of positive tests among children could be far higher, actually, due to incomplete reporting. I also want to play you this soundbite from Kentucky Governor Andrew Bashir. Uh, he's a Democrat in a deeply red state, but he wants to delay in-person learning, uh, and he pointed to this new report. Hopefully you all saw this news nationally. 100,000 kids tested positive in the United States in just the last two weeks of July. It is a myth that kids do not get this virus. Exactly. Like we've been saying all along, uh, and and today uh, today included, that the virus um, does transmit itself into young children. There's data out of South Korea, for instance, that shows teenagers, uh, so high school students, can spread the virus just as easily as any of us adults can. A surprise announcement today from Russian President Vladimir Putin. That's Putin. They're announcing Russia was granted regulatory approval to a COVID-19 vaccine. This comes after less than two months of human testing, and the vaccine still has to complete final trials. Here's CBS medical contributor Dr. David Agus. It's akin to 1957 and a Sputnik moment. Big proclamation, but I'm not sure all the data are there yet. And in fact, this vaccine has been named Sputnik V. Dr. Agus says some experts are concerned about the speed of its approval, but mass production is expected by the end of the year. They've just announced approval. They have not manufactured for the 150 million people in Russia. It will take them many, many months to manufacture enough doses. It's a two-part shot. So they need 300 million doses for the country. Putin seems like he is very optimistic about this drug. He says one of his daughters has already taken it. He said she had a slightly higher temperature after each dose, but... Now she feels well. Okay, uh, we already know there is a lot of skepticism around vaccines in this country alone. Yes. What are the odds anybody's going to take a vaccine from Russia, Dave? I think they're slim. I've already heard from uh, our own Dr. Gordon Cohen, who says he's concerned that there has been nowhere near adequate testing involved, certainly not to uh, American standards. 
And what this amounts to, at least according to some of the initial reports I've read, is a giant experiment on the uh, Russian people. But I'm sure people will weigh the possible danger of a vaccine versus the possible danger of not having a vaccine, and uh, we'll see. Uh, but, um, yeah, this is not one of those things where you you want to be first in line necessarily. Should we care where the vaccine comes from if our own government were to end up approving it, though? Well, no, I don't, no, no, I, I don't have any, I, I don't feel that America's reputation depends on whether uh, we're first to develop our own vaccine or whether we get a vaccine that works and it comes from China or it comes from, uh, or it comes from Russia. I think we're, I think we're past that at this point, right? You want whichever vaccine is safest and, uh, and most effective. And um, that's, uh, that's the main thing. There are genuine concerns that if you release a virus like this, into the public without adequate testing and something goes wrong, you've definitely uh, polluted the waters for any further vaccine that may be released down the road. So I think there there is a risk here, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna hope for the best. I don't want anybody in 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 Russia to be hurt by this. Uh, I have to assume that even Vladimir Putin, as secure as he is in his position, uh, doesn't want to outrage the Russian people with a defective vaccine. So um, we'll just have to wait and see, won't we? Let's talk about air travel during the coronavirus now. All major U.S. airliners now require passengers to wear some kind of face covering on board. But there are still no national guidelines on this, which means airlines can't issue any fines. Transportation Secretary Elaine Chao has refused to support any kind of national mandates, says she'll leave requirements up to individual airlines. Many airlines have instead put their own weight behind enforcement, banning travelers who refuse to wear masks from future flights. And Delta Airlines once turned a flight around and went back to the gate when two passengers refused to put on their masks. Now, you were on a plane over the weekend. What what was it like? Yeah, I was uh, on a plane. I I flew to Wisconsin. That's why I've been out of of town the last week or so. I have family out there. Um, And I I was on Alaska Airlines. So Alaska was actually one of the... One of the first airlines, I want to say, to actually require everybody wear a face covering before they get on board. So I felt pretty comfortable knowing that fact. I also know, because of my flight there, that right after we got off board, they were already cleaning the the seats. They already mm-hmm. had a couple of uh, crew members out there wiping down the seats and sanitizing the place. I know we've reported extensively about you know, the uh, the air filtration system that the planes have on board. So I felt pretty comfortable. The only issue I really had, Dave, was the fact that I had a two-year-old with me. <laughs> and as I was in Wisconsin, the new rule came down from Alaska Airlines saying any child over the age of two is now required to wear a face mask. So I did my best. Uh, How'd that work? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, it was okay. Uh, she she, she kind of likes the idea at first because, you know, mom and dad are wearing it, and yeah. it's kind of a novel idea for her. But after a few minutes, yeah, she's not a huge fan. So we did our best. It did come off at times. The, uh, the flight attendants, you know, they were understanding that it's difficult to rein in a two-year-old, much less make them wear something on their face that they don't want to, especially when they're uh, thirsty and hungry and perhaps a little bit tired as well. One more note, though, I want to say I did see somebody wearing a Trump 2020 mask, a Trump 2020 face mask. So I thought to myself, that's great. (laughs) That's fantastic. (laughs) Because at the beginning, we know the president was not, uh, he wasn't exactly on board with the whole face covering thing. He's been more on board recent in recent weeks, now calling it patriotic. I know we've said on this podcast that I don't care if you don't like it or you you think you're you're a skeptic and you think this thing isn't, you know, airborne or whatever. Uh, protest by wearing a face mask. That's fine by me and right. that's fine by you too. We flew Alaska 2 weeks ago to uh to Pittsburgh and back and they had the center seat open. Uh everybody was wearing the mask. There seemed to be no uh no problem at all. Uh, but I sympathize with you, trying because because I have a 21 month old granddaughter who I don't think would tolerate the mask wearing. 
She barely tolerates sitting in a <laughs> an airline seat for four and a half hours. Uh, so I feel for you. Good for you for trying. Yes, thank you. We're we're back and safe, and we're getting tested today, mind you. So we'll make sure we're all safe. We will be back tomorrow and every day after with a 10-minute rundown of the daily local news. You can subscribe to this podcast. You can also find our news coverage on MindNorthwest.com or listen live at 97.3 FM.